Well, good morning. <laughs> How are we doing this morning? Are we doing okay? Awesome. Okay, so uh, before we get started, I wanted to announce something. Instead of uh, releasing the kids on the third song and interrupting the worship service, we're actually going to have a slide um, up on the screen that will tell the kids to go downstairs. That way we're not interrupting the middle of our worship service. So uh, if you guys would stand up, we're going to worship the Lord this morning, and we'll pray real quick and get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence today. Um, we thank you for the opportunity to worship. I just ask that you would continue to guide our thoughts, and guide our words, and guide our actions as we go about our day and our week. Um, I just ask that you would touch our hearts and allow our hearts to be open and receptive to what you have to speak to us today. We thank you so much for your grace, your love, your mercy. And in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh 
Oh, 
Today, if um, there are some of us in this room that have never experienced what it feels like to be loved by God or to be loved by Jesus, um, there's a line in that song, Holy Spirit, I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. And I wonder if there's someone in this room today that has never experienced what it's like to be loved by Jesus. And to truly know what it's like to have a heart that is free and to where shame is undone and to where my sin has been paid. I wonder if there's someone in this room that has never accepted Jesus into their heart today and wants to make that commitment because they want to know what it feels like to be loved by Jesus. I was sitting here and I just, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't help but share this with you today. Jesus loves you more than you know. For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but he will have everlasting life. Guys, do you believe it today? Do you believe it today? Do you believe it today? I feel like there's someone in this room, either in this room or online, that doesn't know who he is and wants to know, but they've been scared they've been worried and they've been they've been doubting I'm, I'm up here crying and <laughs> but it's it's I'm telling you there's nothing there's nothing like his presence the Holy Spirit is welcome in this house today oh, man I wonder if there's someone here that wants to know what it's like to be loved by Jesus. And I hope the people in this room that do know what it's like can be living representations of what he did and what he said and how he lived. So if you haven't accepted Jesus into your heart today, I want to take a moment. I want to take a moment. If you would close your eyes and, and bow your heads and, and, and pray to God right now and just say, Jesus... I give you my life. I surrender my life today. I recognize that I'm not worthy to be in your presence, but I want my heart to be free. And I want my shame to be undone. 
Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I submit my life to you. I want to be near you. I want to know you. And I want to be used by you, God. I want to be the change. Do you hear my cry today? Thank you so much for your love and your presence. Thank you so much, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That is awesome. That is awesome. And I don't know, I don't know if anybody, if anybody right now just accepts their heart, Jesus into their heart. Um, but if they did, you know. And that's, that's amazing. I think that deserves a round of applause. Can we give a round of applause? Man, you guys can be seated. And if the people who are taking offering this morning um, would come up and receive it, we're going we're gonna to take offering. Um, yeah, so we're going to pray again because I like talking to God a lot. And I like, <laughs> you know, I like, I like praying to him. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to thank him for the offering. So Heavenly Father, we thank you that we get to give you trust in our finances, um, that you use it for good works and good deeds, um, that you would use it to move people closer to Jesus and to build relationships and grow our church. Um, whether we have four or 40 or 400, I just ask that you would take this and use it as a blessing and yeah, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. All right. So as as it's being passed around, I've got a couple announcements for you guys. Um, so we've got the apologetic discussion group. Uh, it's, it starts on Monday, March 25th. It's from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, and it's an opportunity to join us in fellowship and an opportunity to discuss the tough questions about Christianity, uh, the Bible, and God. So feel free to bring a friend. And food is provided. So it, that's, that's a plus. I mean... I'm not coming if there's not food, you know. No, I'm just kidding. But, yeah. Uh, and then lastly, um, we have the Passover dinner. Uh, that's on April 24th at 6 p.m. We will celebrate the events of Exodus and God's power to save. Please speak to Carolyn Connor. Uh, where she, I think she's downstairs. Is she here? I think she's downstairs. Okay. Um, or Pastor Sean. Or Craig Stafford. Uh, and they'll get you more info about it. So we're going to stand up again, actually, and we're going to do meet and greet. So um, uh, I don't know. So if you stand up, and we're going to meet and greet people, just have discussions and get to know each other a little bit. Yeah, so...
All right. All right, you may be seated. Okay, let's pray, and then we'll get moving, huh? I didn't want to interrupt you jibber-jabbering, right? The rest of us, like, the folks... I, I know, so good to see you, sweetie. I could, but I had to say hello to you. Okay, good morning. Uh, I hate to interrupt uh, all the extroverts hanging out. It's so good to have you do that while all the introverts sat and stared hopelessly. So... Uh, yeah. All right. Let's pray. We need prayer, huh? I, I'm not even sure I should be preaching this morning. I think it's already done. She's just dismissed. Haven't received communion. Jack's got it taken care of, huh? Yeah. 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 Uh, so actually, before we pray, I just wanted to thank a couple people. Um, so yesterday we had about 15 people. What in the world, huh? Uh, and Lindsay headed up those 15 people and we cleaned all kinds of stuff. We cleaned toilets, exciting, life-giving, uh, baseboards. If you go down that hallway to the kids' ministry, those baseboards are clean. Now they just need to be painted. Uh, the bathrooms, again, the nursery, all kinds of stuff. So uh, they did a great job. Uh, and then uh, the other one is... Uh, if you have a moment, just take out your app and look at it and go to the events section on your app or even go to the website and look at the calendar on the app. Uh, Sue updated all that stuff. So would you give those two a hand, please, Lindsay and Sue? So let's pray. I got so many emails from Sue. Uh, so... Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness and graciousness. Lord Jesus, we desperately need you. I, I know I do. Uh, and I know I'm lost without you. And so I just ask that you would have your way this morning. God, that you bring clarity to our hearts and our minds. And that you would speak even before anything's said. I know we're all carrying all kinds of stuff. Uh, and I know that you know exactly what that is. So I ask that you would uh, meet us exactly where we're at. The God who restores. Restore our hearts in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. So if you could turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 25. And uh, I know that I preached out of chapter 25 last week, uh, but I needed to uh, go back to it. I felt like we needed to go back to it. Uh, we're just going to do a few verses out of chapter 25. Um, so this incident or what we're looking at in this portion of scripture is David. David, he, uh, he had this amazing moment with King Saul in a cave uh, he didn't kill David, or David didn't kill Saul, which was like a huge victory. And David kept his men from killing him, even though Saul uh, was awful and going after him. So he has this amazing victory. Then uh, David's mentor and father figure, uh, Samuel, passes away. And so can you imagine the heartache that he felt? Uh, the stress that he was going through, he was running for his life. Uh, he wanted to get revenge, but he refused to get revenge and decided that he would let the Lord handle it. And then on top of that, they're, they're hiding and running and all this other stuff. And then, and then this moment happens. And I think that we've all been uh, in a similar moment where, where he's got, he feels all uh, hurt and broken. And then this guy named Nabal, he, uh, David requests something of him that was normal, it was customary. And Nabal hits all of David's insecurities right at this moment, right? So Nabal says, David, you're the runt of your family. 
Oh, wait a minute. You know, your father even forgot who you were. He didn't even care for you and laying out all these things. And so David, in the midst of hit, being hit with all his insecurities, and then this guy that was just a plain jerk, and then he decides to, he makes this decision. And that's what we're going to talk about this decision that David makes. So verse uh, 12, please. David's men turned around and went back. This is after Nabal said all this yucky stuff uh, to David. When they arrived, they reported every single word that was said. So David said to his men, put on your swords. Yeah, it's got an exclamation point and it sounds so much cooler. Uh, so they put on their swords and David put on his. About 400 men went up with David while 200 stayed with the supplies. That awesome piece of scripture. Okay, so David's hit with his insecurities. Uh, he's hit with heartache, frustration. And how does he respond? This is how he responds. Put on your swords. Verse 21. David had just said, it's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property. This is Nabal. In the desert, so the north, so nothing of his was missing. And he has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely. If by morning I leave alive one male... Of all, belong, of all that belongs to him. So I, I don't know if you get this picture. So David's uh, pretty upset. And he is going to make some stuff happen. He's going he's gonna to kill every male that belonged to Nabal. Every male. He's, he's done. He's fit to be tied and all the fun stuff that goes with that. Right? And then he makes this decision that he's going to take it into his own hands. I don't know if you have ever been angry. Have you? Yes. I think that every person in this room has been angry. And so this morning we're going to talk about anger. Or even picking up a fence. Uh, one of the pastors uh, that I connect with um, uh, called another pastor. And this pastor was so upset with him that he said, don't ever call me back. Can you imagine? Right? And, and then I, I just, after reading this piece of scripture, I just thinking about how I have responded in anger so many times. They say that folks with ADHD uh, are impulsive. And so uh, I just remember as a kid, and I, feel, I remember this one time, I was, we lived out in Dry Gulch in the Culver area, and I were riding the school bus. And the school bus back in the day was Fort Colville kids, elementary kids, Fort Colville kids, and high school. And I was a Fort Colville kid. And was riding this bus with this one kid. I don't even remember his name. But I remember he had a poison shirt on. Because this is back in the 80s. And, and poison was a, a, a hair band. That's a proper way to say it. Right? And I just remember this kid. And he said some stuff. And it set me off. And I'm just a little kid. And he's a high schooler. And I just start swinging at him on the bus. I don't remember how it ended, but I'm sh pretty sure that I got my tail kicked. But it was interesting is that as I've looked back on my life, I've had these moments where I would get upset because somebody said something to me. I would pick up that offense and then I would respond to that offense. And I would just go off. And so that has been a consistent struggle for me uh, in general. I've done a lot of foolish things and said a lot of foolish things based off of someone hurt my feelings or uh, I said, they said something to me and then I went off. Here's, here's what's 
interesting uh, about scripture when it comes to anger. There's a verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 9. It says this, that anger resides in the lap of fools. Proverbs 16.32, it says, Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. So, uh, so I, I just ha have been walking through like all this stuff in my anger and in just in response to that and how I respond. And what I've found, and maybe it's different than you, but uh, it, my anger is often like a tube of toothpaste. I know, it seems so silly. Colgate, because it's the cheapest one I can find at the grocery outlet. Uh, but uh, what happens is that uh, oftentimes when I get, take up an offense or I get angry, uh, in my past, I, was, I wasn't slow to anger. And, and by the way, before we go any further, I think you need to understand who God is. The Bible all throughout scripture says that God is slow to anger. He's not quick to take up offense. And he's always right in his anger. He's always right in his anger because he's perfect. And we're rarely right in our anger. Because isn't it true that when we take up offense or when we get angry, it's because we want to be right. But God doesn't want us to be right. He wants us to be righteous. And so, I don't know if you've heard these sayings, like, you make me so mad, I could. Or, uh, you know, uh, somebody had to say it. Right? But what's the problem with that mentality is this, and you know this because you've experienced this firsthand from someone else. I can guarantee it. Somebody gets upset and they need to be right. And so they start letting it out on you, right? Oh, it smells so yummy. I'm going to eat this afterwards. No, that's disgusting. Uh, but what happens is they just let it all out and you know, uh, toothpaste is so messy. It's like thick and sticky. Uh, I guess it's great to clean your faucet, but, uh, but little or anything else, right? And so what happens is that we get so upset and we, we lay out on somebody else. And the truth is, is that we look like a fool. And we de destroy the person that we're angry at. And we certainly don't look like Jesus. He never sinned in his anger. And we do. And Jack, I need you to come and help me, please. Uh, so what happens is that when we're not slow to anger, uh, so Jack, uh, I just need to give this to you. Uh, and I, I found these straws. I'm going to give that to you too. Uh, and I've, I've got some paper towels just in case for later. But I need you to take all of this and put it back into the toothpaste container. Uh, every piece of it. Oh, I can hold the plate. Yeah, I'll hold the plate. And, and then while you're doing this, because I think it'll take a bit, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I mean, you can do it however you want, uh, but you go ahead and do it. Uh, okay, keep at it. Right, why don't we just kind of move over here? Okay, so, so in our anger, what happens is we just kind of let it all out, don't we? And then, and then we're in this predicament, right? We're in this predicament of how do we put it back in? I don't know if you've ever gotten angry with somebody or upset at somebody and you've responded uh, far too often like I responded. 
and you just let it all out or even some of it out and you you look at at what you've done and you just all of a sudden you move from from being someone that maybe was kind and generous and gracious to a a, a fool and then then you try and stuff it all back in but isn't it true that this is a nearly impossible scenario that Jack is doing here. So, so what do you do? How do you navigate this? The first thing is, is that when we do this, we want to justify it. Right? So we, we start looking for ways that demonstrate that we were right and the other person was wrong. Don't we? Or, or we justify it by saying, well, you know, I'm just... I, I'm just saying, you know, I have a friend uh, that I kind of keep my distance from uh, because that friend has this, this habit. They'll get offended or angry and they'll pour it all out and then they'll end it. They'll justify it with the JS, especially on Facebook or just saying, just saying, you know, but even if it's just saying, it doesn't make it right and it doesn't make it so it honors God. And quite frankly, it fractures relationships. And far too often, uh, this stuff is, is done with the closest people that you love, isn't it? And from the closest people that you love. And so you get heart wrecked and hurt and broken. Uh, and so can I ask you a question that maybe would be helpful and making it so the toothpaste, the anger doesn't come out. The fir first thing is this, is who's in charge of your feelings? Who's in charge of your feelings? We say this often in our home uh, because we have a home and we're a family. And so that means that we get upset at each other. And so uh, when one of the kids comes up to me, and right now, it's often Emmett and Rama. Uh, Emmett's crying or Rama's crying. Emmett doesn't seem to cry as much as he did. So Rama does more of the crying right now. And, and she'll go, he did this. And blah, 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 blah. Or he, uh, oh, I'll give you an example. The other day, uh, Emmett kept shushing Rama. And so she's like, Aah! he won't even let me talk. I need to tell him how I feel. It's a microcosm of everyday marriage, isn't it? Uh, and so uh, here's these kids and they're fine. And so one of the questions that we ask is, is who's in charge of your feelings? And you said this because I, well, I'm assuming that you said it. I know I said it. You make me so mad because you did this. You did that. But all of a sudden, what I've done is I've let the other person be in charge of how I feel. I don't know where you're at, but I'm a hot mess enough to, to try and manage my own feelings. But to let someone else be in charge of them, oh, then I'm a wreck. And when it comes to anger, it, it's even worse or even an offense. You make me so mad. Uh, there's this picture uh, uh, that I, I've heard. I didn't, you know, I didn't grow up in church, but I've heard this from vintage saints, uh, this picture of being righteous anger. You know, it's, it's something that I'm righteous about. It's a offense that someone did, and I have every right because it, it's contrary to the word of God. Yes, it might be contrary to the word of God, but when I read through scripture and we look at all the prophets and the folks uh, that claim the word of God and, and, and spoke the truth, uh, nine times out of the 10, they spoke the truth in love. The only one that makes you and I righteous is Jesus. Your acts, my acts, don't make us righteous. Jesus is the one that makes us righteous. And so very rarely do we ever uh, 
say something, do something in anger out of righteousness. Most often, it's done out of trying to be right. And you know what? You might be right. You might be saying the right thing. But when you say it wrongly, it's not right. And the ends never, ever, ever justify the means. And so how do we uh, navigate this and how do we walk through this? If you have your Bibles, could you turn to Ephesians 4, 26 and 27? It is. I'll get there. Thanks, Don. I'll get there. I'll get there. Quit taking my sermon. So, you make me so mad. Uh, so, so, back to that making me so mad. Who's in charge of your feelings? We can choose not to act. We can choose not to open up the toothpaste, right? Now, Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, it says this. In your anger, do not sin. There's this transition that happens. That anger moves into something else. And by the way, anger left undealt with, an offense left undealt with, always leads to something else. As a kid growing up, I seemed to consistently be filled with rage. I would make the stupidest decisions on the worst comments or, or things that weren't that big of a deal. I remember one time I tried to get in a fist fight with my uncle. Again, <laughs> stupid decision. It never works. Uh, but it says, do in your anger, do not sin. So when it's left undealt with, when it's left uh, not addressed, what happens is that we sin. But then there's this next part. Do not let the sun go down while you're angry, still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. You see, this picture with anger, it always leads to something else. But what the Bible says is that it leads to even more than that. It leads to a foothold in our life. I remember my, my pastor told this story of this house in Haiti. Uh, and it was just a small house. It was a one-bedroom home. And uh, this guy, he sold his home. And he, he took a nail and he put it into the wall. And he says, here's the deal. I'm going to sell you this house. But that nail is mine. That nail, I bought it. And so this guy, uh, in the process of selling this house took an animal and hung it on that nail, a dead animal. And so it rotted. And the guy was like, I have a problem with this. This, this, this mess, this rotted flesh is hanging from this nail. He goes, you can't mess with that. That nail is mine. It's per the contract. And the guy would get more and more upset and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And the smell was awful. And he couldn't get it out. So the guy ended up abandoning the property all because of one nail. And so when we, when we don't address the anger that, that we have, when we let it fester and we let that offense fester and we let it get a hold of us, it's like that nail in that home. The home could be beautiful as all get out. But eventually it gets a hold of us. And eventually it rots. And eventually it stinks. And eventually it destroys. And so, so that picture of responding passively or even responding aggressively in anger is sin. And that piece of scripture that says that don't let, don't let the sun go down on your anger, it, it, it's partly timeline. But it's more about letting anger get a hold of you. When anger gets a hold of you, it's poured all out. And so, 
back to Don and his part of the message <laughs> is that when we, when we do this, when we let our anger out, however way we do it, via social media or to a person, it's nearly impossible to, bold to put it back in. And you know this. Once you've, once you've said something, once you've done something, uh, putting it back in is a huge mess. So then my question is, is maybe it's the same as yours, how could I make it so it doesn't come out? How do I address it before it comes out? The, the first thought in that is, is you address it before it comes out. Your thoughts and your feelings are yours. Uh, no matter how you feel or think about that, that statement, the truth is, is that you're responsible for them. You're the one that's in charge of them. Nobody else is. You're in control of those. And so if you're like me and maybe have ADHD, you're like, oh, great. I'm an impulsive person. How am I going to navigate this? It's not going to happen. It's going to take a miracle of God. That's true. It is. It does. Take an intervention of God. So here are some ways. Uh, can we have Jack be done, you think? My hand is getting tired. Why don't you just put the toothpaste thing right here? We just have... Lindsay, did you see that? We just cleaned this. It's a mess. I know. Jack Allen? No. Jack Earl? William. Jack William Callinger. You should have been named Earl. That's the best middle name ever. Right, Al? All right. Okay, you can sit down. And you can take these with you. Okay. Okay, so this picture of, so how do I navigate it? There's this verse in Proverbs 15.1. It says this. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word, it stirs up anger. Wait a minute. A gentle answer. Uh, I, I have this tendency, yes, I have this tendency to be a little bit impulsive and stuff, but I also have this other tendency that maybe is not the same as you, but I'm, I have a tendency to just be like super aggressive about almost anything, right? Uh, if I'm going to put my socks on, I'm going to put them so hard on, on so hard that I'll poke a hole out the toe, right? I'm just, it's just me. When I get in a pool... I'm not going to wade in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a cannonball. I'm going to go all the way in, right? So if I'm going to do something, I'm going to have a tendency to do it overboard. I mean, remember having a, a water fight with my mom. Uh, it was just not a big deal, right? My mom's back there, so you can ask her. Uh, it wasn't a big deal. And she got me wet. And so I ran outside and got the hose and brought it into the house. <laughs> right? Do you remember that, Mom? It makes you feel all fuzzy, doesn't it? No. Okay. Uh, and so I just had this tendency. So in order for something good to come out, we have to be intentional about it. And it always begins with our thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10.5 it says this, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, what's interesting about this statement is something that I always hang on. And this is what I would teach my runners when I was coaching track is that you're to take every thought captive. I didn't tell them that it was from the Bible, right? But you're, you're in charge of your thoughts and you're the one that makes a decision uh, what you're going to entertain and what you're not. I always tell my runners that because running is such a mental battle. Have you ever done it? Ah, man, if you run like a mile, you're like, 
man, what was I thinking? Ah, there's something wrong with me, right? But, but the truth is, is that when you run, you, you, all kinds of things go through your head and you process all kinds of stuff. And the only way to, to change that, what you're thinking about, is to have something in your pocket to exchange it with. And that's what I would teach my runners. I said, before we even go for a run, when you have that moment where you want to stop running, where you want to give up, where your legs are burning and your lungs are burning, your legs feel like you're moving through concrete, cement, as we would say in Yakima, uh, what are you going to think about? And they're like, well, I don't know. I said, why don't you consider that first? So, so our, our walk with Jesus is very similar. Is that we all have thoughts and it says to take every single thought captive. Not just the bad ones, not just the good ones, but all of them. And then we take them captive and then we su submit them to Jesus Christ. So what that means, and, and maybe the better way to say this is that every thought that I have that is not of God needs to be exchanged with the truth of God. Every thought that I have that's not of God needs to be exchanged with the truth of God. And the truth of God is not my truth is different than your truth. The truth of God is always the same. And it comes through scripture. The truth always the same. And it comes through scripture. It's not my truth. It's not your truth. It's not Jim Bob's truth. It's not Betty Lou's truth. The Bible dictates what truth is. And, and so, so it always begins with our thoughts. And so when those thoughts come in and somebody has uh, said something to you or done something to you, maybe they've hurt, hit an insecurity then the first step is this. Is that true? Is that true? Does that match up with the word of God? And sometimes somebody doesn't need to say anything. But there seems to be these intrusive thoughts in our lives that, that kind of hit our insecurities. Don't they? I'm not good enough. I'm worthless. I have no value. Those all are against scripture. The truth is, is that every person in this room and online and outside of this room and on the planet is fearfully and wonderfully made. That they were, they were made in the image of God. And God is good. And he doesn't, he doesn't make throwaways. He doesn't create accidents. He's intentional. And so when someone hits that insecurity, uh, it's really important that we take those thoughts captive and put them under the submission of Jesus Christ. Because if we don't, it always leads to something else. Captives. So we have to exchange the truth for a lie. And we choose what we think. That's what that verse says, doesn't it? I can keep, take my thoughts captive. So I choose it. I make that decision. That's up to me. And so I can choose that. Philippians uh, 4, 8, and 9. I just want you to hit it there. So, so not only do we need to take our thoughts captive by exchanging them with the truth, which is the word of God. And by the way, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth. So we're literally exchanging lies with Jesus as a priority in our life. Now, so we take our thoughts captive, we exchange those thoughts, but we also have to make a daily decision to nurture and develop a peaceable nature. We make a daily decision to nurture and develop a peaceable nature. What does that mean? So if we're thinking stuff, and we're, we're taking the, exchanging those thoughts. Now let's get to Philippians 4, 8, and 9. So what, do I, what am I to think about? What am I to process? 
It says this, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So, so what that says to me is that, is that when I intentionally think about the things of God, by the way, all these things are God, right? Uh, whatever is true. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We say the Bible is the truth of God, right? It's true. Whatever is noble, there's no one more noble than Jesus. Whatever is right, uh, I want to say that I'm right, but the truth is, is that I'm not. Who is right is Jesus. He's always right. He's perfectly right. Now, I know that you're really smart people and sometimes you're really opinionated and sometimes you might be right. But I guarantee you, you're not always right. And recognizing that is really, really important. Especially if you live in a home with other people. This is why, why, why I mean that. Because if, if you're always right, there's no room for you to be righteous. Because you're going to fight from that position of being right instead of fighting from a responsibility to be righteous. And so, do you know what I mean by that? Let's rephrase that. You can either be right or you can be more like Jesus. The choice is, is ours. And he, God empowers us to be righteous. But the truth is, you and I saying we're sorry has more white, right, more weight to it than you and I saying we were right. Doesn't it? Uh, you and I navigating life by letting go of offenses has more power than you and I being right and taking up offenses. Now, who we hand and with Oh, okay, cool. let's go to Proverbs twenty-two, twenty-four. So we see this picture. Our thoughts are important. What we exchanging truth for a lie, but also intentionally and daily nurturing uh, thoughts that are from God. Garbage in, garbage out. Grace and mercy in, grace and mercy out. Are you following me? Okay. Proverbs twenty two twenty four. Do not make friends with a hot tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered. Back to that friend that I rarely uh, spend time with. Actually, avoid this person because they're a hothead and they say all kinds of awful things in the name of whatever. And somebody had to say it. I just needed to say it. Did you know that your offenses, you taking up offenses, your criticalness, your anger is contagious. It's contagious. It, it spreads like a wildfire. You think about it. Just take a moment just to process your friends that struggle with uh, taking up offenses, the struggle with, with being angry, the struggle with, uh, I just need to say what I need to say because they need to hear, hear it, mentality. Think about those folks. Now, take a moment to think about all the folks that are around them. Rarely will you find someone around them that is not critical. 
that is not angry, that is not bitter. Rarely will you find that because it's contagious. It's like a cancer that spreads. And not only is it contagious, but it's, it's, it consumes us. And when it consumes us, then rage comes out. Or just being critical. So, uh, back to the toothpaste thing. What is it that you would want your life to look like? Do you really want to be associated with being bitter, angry, and critical? Do you really want your life to be known as one that, that destroys others instead of builds them? One that, that just says whatever they think instead of offers mercy and grace? Do you want that? I, I would assume that you wouldn't want that. But the truth is, is that if a majority of the words that come out of your mouth and the actions that follow your thoughts are critical and bitter, that's what you produce. Now, how do you know that that's you? How do you know that that's you? Well, you can start with that scripture of Philippians 4, 8, and 9. If you were to take an inventory of your thoughts and what you think about and what you watch and what you hear, are they going to match up with that piece of scripture? If they don't match up with that piece of scripture, then my guess is that what comes out of you is the thing that people are considered to, to, to avoid. But in order to recognize that, what that means is that you have to be honest to God. Uh, there's this saying that every family has a crazy Uncle Billy. And if you can't figure out who the crazy Uncle Billy is, then it's you. Uh, sometimes that's you. Uh, it's me and my family, I'm pretty sure. No? Who's crazy Uncle Billy, Mom? We'll talk about it later. You are on Facebook. Oh, I am on Facebook. Oh, that's good truth. Good point, good point. <laughs> Call out my own family. Uh, so anger is contagious and it consumes us. James, uh, remember when I was saying that, that we often strive for what is right over righteous? It's interesting, uh, James 1, 19 through 21, it says this. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of uh, this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Because human anger, what you and I produce out of anger, does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Interesting, isn't it? How amazing is scripture that it points it out like that? Uh, Matthew 5, 9. And this will be my, my last point. I like to look at my father-in-law because then I've got another 30 minutes or an hour, right? After that, last point in a message. Matthew 5, 9. It says, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the children of God. This is what uh, Jesus said. So, so going back. So how do I navigate anger? Uh, the first one, it always begins with my thoughts. Second one is this. It's, it's important that I exchange my thoughts with something. And that something needs to be the word of God. Because that's the only thing that produces good. The third thought is this. Is that in order uh, for me to not sh uh, all that anger, uh, it's important that I personally... And I would suggest that you personally would need to take time to think about whatever's pure, true, noble, lovely, 
All these things. Think about God, his word. And p- store that. Nurture, nurture it on a daily basis. Because what we put in comes out. What we don't put in doesn't come out. So it's important what we put in. Uh, next thought is this. Is that whatever... If we are, if we're, our anger is contagious and it consumes us. Our, us picking up offenses, it, it, it's contagious and it consumes us. Uh, us being bitter, it, it is contagious and it consumes us. Are you following that line of order? Us being critical. Us being critical is contagious and it consumes us. It's not righteous behavior. It's not in alignment with the word of God. It's definitely not in alignment with Jesus. So Matthew 5, 9, Jesus makes this statement. Blessed are the peacemakers. I, I want you to see that word peace maker. It's not peacekeeper. It's peacemaker. So so here's the difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. A peacekeeper looks for any way, every way to avoid confrontation. Looks for any and every way to to just keep the water still and to not make waves. A peacemaker builds peace, looks for ways to restore, looks for ways to build, makes it available. So so that's where we get that, that picture. Again, going back to what I said earlier about speaking truth in love. There's not a lot of peace makers there's a whole lot of peacekeepers and so the only way to truly make peace around us is to speak truth from a position of love now we can say i'm just saying or somebody had to say it and we just speak the truth and and honest honestly It's like taking a sledgehammer to a relationship. It's going to just destroy everything. It's not going to build anything. So when we speak truth in love, that big word love, when we're humble about it, gracious about it, if you go back to 1 Samuel 25, you'll see exactly how to speak truth in love because that's, what Abigail did. She was humble. She was bold. She was kind. She was gracious. And she reminded David of all that God had done. That's speaking the truth in love. So what that means is that I approach a situation with 100% grace and 100% truth. Means that I'm taken to build a wall. I'm going to use a framing hammer not a sledgehammer. Means that, that when I approach a situation, it's going to be warm and fuzzy like a teddy bear and it's going to be productive like a hammer. Are you following me? So, making peace. A peacemaker. So, so back, back to the anger, back to the, all the things that we've been talking about, taking offense. First one is your thoughts. Who's in charge of them? You or someone else. Next is what you do with those thoughts. Do you exchange them with the truth or do you exchange them with more lies? And the third is do you make a daily decision to intentionally build peace in your heart and your life.
think about such things. Think about God and his kindness to you. Think about his word and put it in. Next. What do you do with your anger? And who do you spend your time with? If you're in that place, and I think we've all been there at times, where we are consumed and contagious with our anger, can I tell you this? There's a way out. You don't have to be there. You don't have to live like that. But you do have to recognize it in order to get out. And when you recognize it in order to get out, you have to be honest with God. Say, God, I'm sorry. Boy, I can't believe my mouth or my actions. I, I just can't do this. Please help me. Please forgive me. Help me to be intentional about what I think about. Help me to take every thought captive. Remind me of your truth. Help me to think about all those lovely things that you are. Help me to dwell on that. Jesus, I need you to get me out because I can't stuff this toothpaste back in but you can. So would you do it? And then finally, Lord Jesus, make us peacemakers. People that bring peace. People that build peace. People that encourage peace. Help me to build peace instead of keep. Help me to give instead of take. Would you stand with me this morning? Would you just take a moment to bow your heads and close your eyes? Your head is bowed and your eyes are closed. Would you just be honest to God? Just between you and him, nobody else. Do you find yourself saying, you make me so mad to other people? Do you find yourself saying, ah, well, somebody had to say it. I just had to say it, just saying. Do you find yourself being critical more than encouraging and life-giving? If you answered yes to any of those statements, this is your moment. This is your moment. Jesus always meets us where we're at. So would you just ask him to meet you where you're at? Would you just take a moment to say, I'm sorry? Would you take this moment to not leave it there? And say, I need help. Would you tell Jesus that you can't, but you know he can Heavenly Father, our hearts are open to you. We ask that you would have your way. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would speak to each and every heart that's here this morning. That they'd be honest to you. Thank you that you could do something about it. 
So I ask that you would do something about it as well. Please help us in those moments where we just feel like we need to be right. Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd help us keep our mouths shut to to deal with our thoughts. Help us to make the priority of being right with you is more important than being right with anybody else. Help us to make daily decisions that honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. I think, I think sometimes, um, there we go. <laughs> I think sometimes, uh, not sometimes, it's daily. Um, there's a war that goes on in our mind. Um, as we're battling thoughts against the enemy. Um, and we need to take our thoughts captive and put it under the submission of Jesus Christ. Um, I recognize that we can't do it without him. We can't control our anger and our bitterness and being critical um, and being a fault finder, I tend to be like that sometimes. I, I know, I mean, today's message really spoke to my heart um, that I would not be able to control that if it weren't for him. Um, so we're going to take communion this morning um, and recognize that we need him, and we're going to remember um, that. So if the people that are passing out communion could come forward. Uh, and then everyone can be seated for a moment um, as those are passing out, as those are being passed out. Heavenly Father, I just ask, that we would give our thoughts to you and you, that you would help guide our thoughts and our words and our actions in the decisions that we make. Recognize that I'm in control of my feelings because thoughts and feelings change, but you never change. And your truth is the truth and the only truth. It isn't just the truth, it is truth. It's what we base our life off of. of. We need you every day. Philippians 4, chapter 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Verse 5 says, Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. And it's hard to be gentle. It's hard for our gentleness to be evident when we're angry and when we're bitter and being critical. So, Father, I ask that you would help us to rejoice always and remember what you did. Your body was broken and beat, and your blood was shed. <laughs> so that I could know you. And that you could help me have self-control. And that you could help me and guide me in my life in general. Um, so that I, I pray that you continue to guide and protect and bless those of us that are in this room and the people of this world. And remember what you did. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for your mercy and your grace and your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.
this bread or cracker <laughs> represents uh, Jesus' body being broken for us as the ultimate sacrifice so that we can know him and then represent his love in that way too. So would you break the bread this morning? And he also shed his blood for us, and this represents his blood being shed. Would you take that this morning as well? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. I don't know if I'll ever be able to fully comprehend what it means to be in the presence of God and to be loved by you. I'm in awe of you. You are truly wonderful. When I'm angry and when I'm insecure and I begin to believe the lies that the enemy has put in my head, help me to remember to, to replace that with the truth. And to not just be peacekeepers, but be peacemakers and confront that anger in our own lives in our own lives not in other people's but in our own lives thank you so much for all that you do that I get to call you my faithful father and my friend the one I get to spend time with every morning in your word and in your presence Every day and every moment, I need you. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you guys for being here today. Whether you're here in person or online, uh, you guys are dismissed. Don't forget to go pick up your kids. Thank you.